All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the history of sound recording and music. So sound recording instruments were initially described as talking machines and then later as phonographs uh, drawing names on existing inventions. So the telephone and the telegraph, um, this is kind of similar how movies were once referred to as motion pictures, a term dragged from photography. And then radio, radio was also known as wire, wireless telegraphy. So this early blend of technology kind of helped to pave the way for future convergences, which we will talk about in our media convergence lecture. But the biggest and most profound of these convergences were sound recording and radio. So here we have the development stage. So using Hogg's hair bristle, uh, French painter Edward Leon Scott de Martinville conducted the first experience, experiments with sound recording. He tied one end to a thin membrane stretched over the narrow part of a funnel. Speaking into the funnel, the membrane vibrated and the free end of the bristle made grooves on a revolving cylinder coated with thick liquid called lamp black. He noticed that the different sounds made different tracks in the lamp black, but he could not figure out how to play that back. So he was making sounds and seeing them recorded. That was kind of the essence of this early development. His, experiment, his experiments ushered in the development stage of sound recording as a mass medium. In 1877, Thomas Edison successfully recorded his own voice by using a needle to press his own, his own voice sound waves onto a tin foil wrapped around a metal cylinder. And this was about the size of a cardboard toilet paper roll. He then... Uh, played it back by repositioning the needle to retrace the grooves in the foil. This machine was known as the phonograph, and in 1878, he patented it, and this was known as the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial stage. So, sound recording to mass media. The narrow definition of his phonograph, so it was only used as with foil cylinders, that was the patent, it led the way for Chester Bell to patent the graphophone. So this was an improvement on the phonography uh, by allowing the playback of sound to take place on, a dur on durable wax cylinders instead of the foil. The phonograph and the graphophone were limited, though, in their abil abilities to ineffect and ineffectual for mass production. So it was a solo production. Emil Berlinger was a German engineer, and he took it one step further and developed round, flat discs, or records, that were coated with beeswax and zinc and played on a turntable called a gramophone. He patented this in 1887, and the difference between Berlinger is that he was able to mass produce his round records. So where Edison and Martinville uh, created something that was kind of a personalized voice recording, Berlinger took it one step further and created mass uh, and the ability for mass production. So using Edison's cylinder, performers had to play or sing into the speaker for each separate recording. Berlinger's disc featured master recordings from which copies could be easily duplicated in mass quantities. His records also allowed labels to be attached, di differentiating between the artists. So this brought sound to its mass medium stage. In 1906, the Victor Talking Machine Company placed the hardware or guts of a record player inside a piece of furniture. They called these Victorolas, and these were mechanical and had to be primed with a crank handle. As more homes were wired for electricity, electric record players in 1925 became an essential appliance in all American homes. The appeal for recorded music, though, was limited at first due to sound quality. So the original wax records were replaced by shellac discs, but these records were very fragile and did not improve the sound quality much. The 1930s showed a decline, though, in radio, mainly due to the Great Depression, and sales for records and phonographs declined. But shellac was also needed for the World War II munis munitions production in the 1940s, so the rep record company switched to polyvinyl plastic records instead. The vinyl records, as shown here, were a hit, and they were as they were more durable than shellac re records. So here's record types. In 1948, CBS Records introduced the 33.5 RPM, or revolutions per minute. So this offered 20 minutes of music on each side. This created a market for multi-song al albums and classical music. Prior, the 78 uh, uh, revolving re revolutions per minute records held only 3 to 4 minutes of music. 
So the RCA, Radio Corporation of America, responded by creating a 45 RPM. This was considered the jukebox record. The two records developed by both CBS and RCA ended up needing their own record players, defying the competition. So eventually, after a five-year marketing battle, a compromise was set in 1952, and the LP, or uh, CBS's uh, 33 and a half, 33 and one third RPM, became the standard for long-playing albums, and the 45 became the standard for singles. So record players were redesigned to include all three versions, the old 78s, which had the three to four minutes of music, the new 45s, and the LPs. The 1940s, during World War II, a German engineer developed a magnetic tape that helped to launch the advent of the magnetic audio tape. So audio tapes, lightweight Ma magnetized uh, strands made it possible to finally include sound editing and multiple track mixing. So this included instrumentals and vocals recorded at one location and later mixed onto a master recording in another studio. By the 1960s, engineers had placed miniature reel-to-reel -reel audio tape inside some plastic cassettes and developed portable cassette players. So this allowed listeners to bring music with them and created a market for pre-recorded cassettes. Now we go into digital recording. So the biggest recording, recording advancement came in the 1970s when electrical engineer Thomas Stockham made the first digital audio recordings on standard computer equipment. Although the digital recorder was invented in 1967, Stockham was the first to put it to practical use. In contrast to analog recording, which cap captures the fluctuations of sound waves and stores those signals in a record's grooves or a tape's continuous stream of magnet magnetized par particles, digital recording translates sound waves into binary on and off pulses that and stores the information as numerical code. When a digital recorder is played back, a microprocessor translates those numerical codes back into sounds and sends them to loudspeakers. By the late 1970s, Sony and Philips were jointly working on a way to design a digitally recorded disc and player to take advantage of this new technology, which could be produced at a lower cost than either vinyl records or audio cassettes. As a result of their efforts, digitally recorded compact discs, or CDs, hit the market in 1983. CD sales soon doubled LPs by 1987, and in 2000, CDs had completely replaced audio cassettes. All right, the Internet and recording companies. The Internet hit in the 1990s and forever changed and challenged the music industry. Known as a mass medium that links individuals and communities together, the Internet offered the highest level of mass production for all mass mediums. Sean Fanning said that his goal for creating the groundbreaking file sharing site Napster in 1999 was to build communities around different types of music. The standard formats, the standard formats were irrevocably cha changed by the launch of Napster, and by 2000, the industry was grasping to survive. With the increasing popularity of the internet by the mid-1990s, computer users began swapping MP3 music files uh, to, instead of CDs. So the, the MP3 music files enabled digital recordings to be compressed into smaller, more manageable files. Despite advanced CD format, the music industry launched in the 1990s, music fans enjoyed the convenience of downloading MP3 files, mostly illegally. The music industry fought in individual downloaders, but it didn't hamper the popularity of MP3s. So let's talk about streaming music. The hit happened when the arrival of the net the next big digital format, streaming music. In the language of the music industry, we are shifting from ownership of music to access of music. So the access model has been driven by the availability of streaming services such as the Sweden-based Spotify, which arrived in the US in 2011 and hit 71 million worldwide subscribers in 2018. Spotify now has competitors such as Apple Music, Google Play Music, Amazon Music, and SoundCloud. With these services, listeners can pay a monthly fee of $5 to $10 and instantly play millions of songs on demand via the internet. YouTube and Vivo also supply ad-supported music streams and have wide international use. 
The key difference, though, between streaming music like Spotify and streaming radio like Pandora, Pandora is that streaming music enables a listener to select any song on demand. Streaming radio enables a listener to pick a style of music but lacks the option of songs on demand. But even these... Uh, even these are blurred, these lines, as Spotify's free version still includes ads and commercials. All right, so let's talk about the radio and record battle. So back in 1915, when the phonograph became a popular form of entertainment, the recording industry sold over three, 30 million records that year. Sales continued to triple until 1924, but in that year, the sales dropped nearly half of what they had been, all due to the arrival of radio. Radio is a competing mass medium to music as it provides free entertainment over the airwaves, independent of the recording industry. In 1915, the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers formed to collect copyright fees for music publishers and writers. They charge, ra they charge that radio was contributing to the plummeting sales of records and sheet music. In 1925, the ASCAP established fees for radio. They charged stations between $250 to $2,500 a week for the right to play recorded music. This led to many stations leaving the air. Other stations responded by establishing their own live in-house orchestras offering free music to listeners. The rec record companies could not legally infringe on this route as it was free of any copyright, copyright scandals. In the 1920s, in 1930s, there was a slow decline of record sales. However, with the lifting of the prohibition in 1933 and the invention of the jukebox, record sales peaked again. The jukebox was a standard musical entertainment for taverns and bars, and thus the sales continued to increase. It wasn't um, until the 1950s that the music industry and radio began to finally work together. In the 1950s, television took both pieces, both industries for free. They took the radio shows and showcased the music industry's live performances. This, the alliance then of the music industry and the radio formed in the manner of a hit song. So the radio would introduce a hit song and in turn boost the sales of an album. The arrival of rock created a youth market for sound recordings and provided the much needed content for radio just as it seemed television would overwhelm both mediums. However, in the late 2000s, the arrangement frayed. While internet streaming radio stations were being required to pay royalties to music companies when they played their songs, radio stations still got to play music royalty-free over the air. So the largest radio station with more than 1,500 live stations on iHeartRadio, Clear Channel, in 2012 was the first company to strike a new deal with the recording industry and pay royalties for music played over the air. Since that first deal, other radio groups have begun to forge agreements with music labels, paying royalties for on-air play while getting reduced rates for streaming music. Obviously, this is still a developing field as technology keeps introducing more avenues of sharing these mediums, and it's something that we can all keep an, uh, an eye out for. So stay tuned for our lecture on media convergence, which will be up next. Thank you.